Thanks, Gautam, uh, for that introduction. Um, yeah, so before I get into the talk, I just want to mention that a bunch of us are live blogging this. So if you have friends who are not fortunate enough to make it out to the conference, uh, you know, tweet this link out at them. Um, we're ver working very hard to get the, the technical content of all the talks down so that uh, people not at the actual conference can, can uh, participate as well. So I'm here to talk about metaprogramming in Go. But before I jump into that, uh, I just wanted to give a brief overview of my own background and why it is I came to be here today to talk about this particular subject. So about a year and a half ago, I started a website called Sourcegraph with a friend of mine from Stanford. And for those of you who don't know, actually, who, who here has not heard of Sourcegraph? OK, a lot of you. So what it is is it's a website that lets you search for pieces of code, see usage examples of how other people use that code, and browse around the code in a very fluid manner that, that's really useful when you're reading through code and trying to figure out what it does. So um, uh, Aaron, uh, when you're you know, passively reading code, uh, try using Sourcegraph instead of GitHub. It lets you jump to definition and shows you usage examples. It gives you a lot of the great things you get, you get in an IDD, but just in your browser. Um, but to put it another way, what Sourcegraph is, is it's essentially a program we wrote to help us be better programmers. And in working on a product like that, we've thought a lot about how we can create and use programs that let us program more effectively. And a lot of the programs we've created and used fall under this general category of metaprograms. So who here knows what metaprogramming is? OK, so a good portion of you. For those of you who haven't heard the term before, a metaprogram is just a program that treats other programs as its data. So it either generates, modifies, or analyzes the source code of other programs. And that's a pretty broad definition. It means a lot of things to you know, various people. But typically, when you say the term metaprogramming, if you're coming from a different language community, you're thinking of things like C++ template metaprogramming, or Lisp macros, or Ruby method missing. These are uh, considered experts territory, often, oftentimes. Uh, you're sort of warned away from using them because it's easy to kind of shoot yourself in the foot and do things that are kind of overly fancy and overly complicated and end up you know, hurting hurting you down the road. But today I want to challenge the notion that meta necessarily implies fancy. And in particular, you know, when you think about what we do as programmers, a lot of what we do is we're automating tedious but important tasks by writing instructions to a computer so that the computer do, can do it so that we don't have to get a human to do it. And all metaprogramming is is automating uh, tedious but important programming tasks that happen to be related to the art and craft of programming. It doesn't have to be fancy. It's actually quite easy to do, especially in Go. And more people should do it. So I want to ground the discussion in a, a concrete uh, example. So this is a problem that probably all of us have uh, dealt with at some point in our lives, which is writing a web application. So this is a typical architecture of a web application. You sort of have uh, you know, your top layer, which is your front end, which is responsible for fielding requests from the user's browser and generating HTML. You have uh, a middle tier that's the API that responds to requests from the uh, HTML layer, returns JSON. And then you have a, a bottom layer, which is the data store, which receives requests from the API, issues queries to the database, and then returns that data up the stack. Um, this is a, just a very generic architecture. If you're interested in more about how we, the particulars of, of our web app, web app architecture at Sourcegraph, you can check out my co-founder Quinn's talk at Google I.O. from last year. But for the purpose of this talk, just keep this general picture in your mind as we go through examples of how you know, we use met metaprogramming to make this process easier. So when you're working on an application, there's a couple of you know, high-level goals that you'd like your code to have. So one of those is you want good, fast unit tests. You want the tests to cover the application code um, well, and you want them to be able to, to run quickly. Another thing you want to do is you want to have high confidence in the correctness of critical logic. So this is you know, stuff like payments processing or permissions checking, stuff that if you get wrong, uh, it can really screw over your users. And the third is you want to be able to deploy in a hassle-free manner. You know, the last thing you want to do uh, when you're ready to ship a product is worry about you know, configuring the production environment and getting into um, you know, the details of you know, setting environment variables and AWS and things like that. So how can metaprogramming help us do these three things better? So the first goal, writing good, fast tests. So in order to have good, fast tests, uh, you need good mocks. And uh, what a mock is, is it's essentially um, 
a way to replace different components in your app with fake implementations of those components. Uh, so in your tests, you can focus on testing one component at a time and sort of mock away all the other components. And this lets the tests be focused in terms of what they're testing and also lets them run quickly because when you're testing something, it's not actually you know, hitting the database because you've mocked the database away. So this is a common mock pattern in Go. Um, you know, in, our, in our web app, we might have this core service, uh, which is defined as an interface, which has a, has a bunch of methods. And this is sort of the essence of our app. So for each piece of functionality in our web app, there's a corresponding method in this service. Uh, the actual implementation of the service will do something like hit the database uh, and return the data. But the mock implementation of the service, all it does is it has a stub function field, which the test overrides and tells it to return something simple. Um, and yeah, that's, it's pretty straightforward. So this is, this is a very common pattern in Go, and it's very useful. But what happens when you want to add a bunch of features to your app? So when you add a bunch of features, that means you need to add a bunch of methods to this interface. And when you add a bunch of methods to this interface, you got to add a bunch of methods to the implementations of that interface. And uh, that means you have to add a bunch of methods to the mock. And mock code is the most boring, tedious code ever to write. You're basically just like, look at, look at all of what these methods are doing. Each one of them is just, you know, forwarding the arguments to the corresponding uh, stub function field. Uh, and this is very painful because anytime you want to add a new feature, now you got to go copy and paste a bunch of this code and, and generate this uh, manually. So we wrote a small command to help us essentially generate this automatically. It's called genmox. And what it does is, you know, it uses the AST parsing libraries and the AST parsing packages in the Go standard library. And what it does is it reads through all the files. You pass it uh, a, 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 Go, a Go package. It reads through all the files in that package. And for every interface that, whose name ends in service, it will look at the methods and then auto-generate uh, the code for the mock for that service in a file uh, that is just the file name underscore mock. And this is super simple. Um, because the Go packages in the standard lib are, are really good about presenting good APIs for dealing with things like the AST, uh, this command is just 200 lines of code. And you can check it out right now if you want. OK, so we use GenMox to, to help us write mocks and, and write better tests. Uh, the other goal that I mentioned, um, if you recall, is we want to ensure the correctness of critical pieces of functionality in our application. So in our case, checking permissions is absolutely critical. So SourceGraph is uh, an application that deals in code, and we host both public and private code. And the last thing we want to do is allow an unauthorized user to access code that they're not supposed to. Right? That would be terrible. So there are two ways uh, we should do this. Obviously, first have unit tests that test that we're checking permissions. So have a test that you know, tries to call this get repository method with a, an unauthorized user and check that it returns a, a permit, permission denied error. Uh, the second way we do it is with strong code reviewing practices. So ensuring that every time we review a change to a key interface like this, um, the reviewer should go through and you know, look, for, look to make sure that it is indeed checking permissions. And even though this seems like you know, two layers of security, like two, uh, two lines of defense, it's actually quite easy to screw up in practice. So you know, consider two scenarios. The first scenario is you know, we're a small, fast-moving company. The code is changing rapidly. We have this big pull request where a bunch of code is changing. And when a bunch of uh, actual code is changing, um, a lot of the test code changes as well. And it's very easy to modify the tests in such a way that uh, you somehow eliminated the test that makes sure that you check the permissions. And then when it goes to code review, you have all this code, new code that's been written that's probably complex and you know, hard to understand. And the reviewer is probably going to be focusing on trying to understand that piece of functionality. And making sure that it checks permissions is probably an afterthought. And it's e easy to overlook as a human. Another scenario is you add a new piece of functionality. So you know, we add this new method called delete repository to our service. And for, because we're so focused on implementing the actual functionality of this method, it's easy to forget to add you know, permissions check at the very beginning. And it's easy to forget to add the tests that check for the permissions check. So basically, we wanted um, a sanity check. We basically wanted to be warned anytime we tried to push code 
that uh, added uh, a method to an interface or um, basically resulted in a method on this interface not checking permissions. So to do that, we wrote this very simple uh, library. I hesitate to even call it a library. It's really just 300 lines of code that offers like one convenience function for querying the AST. So it's kind of like the idea is like just like uh, jQuery kind of lets you query the, the DOM easily. Uh, Go AST query lets you specify queries over, over the AST. Um, and the reason we did that is because this constraint, warn me if any service method doesn't call a function called has permission, can be specified over the AST of the code. So basically what it does is it uses the AST package in the Go standard library. Um, it finds all the uh, service interfaces in code. It looks through all the methods, and for each method, makes sure that there is a function called, a function called has permission uh, in that function. Um, and if you're interested in checking this out, um, here are a few links that you can follow um, to learn by example. And using this library, we can write this permissions check command that uh, does what we want it to do in basically 10 lines of code, which is awesome. Another thing you might want to do to verify the correctness of your application is check the package import structure. Um, so what that means is, you know, let's say, recall you have the three layers in your web app. And you have uh, the application layer, which defines the HTML generation code, and that's in the app package. And at the very bottom, you have a DB package that sort of controls access to the underlying database. And in the middle, you have your API layer. And the API layer is the layer that contains all the permissions checking code. And what you want to avoid is direct accesses from the app layer to the DB layer, because those will essentially bypass all permissions check. So all the, the hard work that you invested in, in making sure that you know, this service was secure, um, you can bypass if you know, there's, there's direct accesses from app to DB. And you actually don't have to write any code to do this. It's super simple. You just use a subcommand of the Go tool called Go list. Go list lists metadata uh, about Go packages, and that metadata includes all the imports in that package. So this is a neat one-liner. You can just list all the uh, uh, packages that the app package imports and search for you know, database-related packages. So that's another quick sanity check that we run uh, to avoid shooting ourselves in the foot. And I'd be remiss uh, if I talked about you know, uh, sort of libraries and packages that allow you to ask questions about the code if I didn't mention the Go Oracle. So the Go Oracle is something that's been added you know, relatively recently, um, like in the past year or so. It's a powerful library and tool for asking questions uh, about code. And it's incredibly power powerful. It answers questions like, you know, what are all the interfaces satisfied by type? What are the possible concrete types of an interface variable? What are the callers of a function? Not just direct callers of that function, but uh, callers that call the function through a function pointer. It, it knows about those. Um, and a bunch of other things. And we actually could implement a stronger version of our permissions check uh, on top of the Go Oracle. And we're thinking about doing that in the future. The reason that we haven't done so yet is that it does have to take an entire application as the scope of its analysis. And our code base is kind of large and it tends to take a little bit longer to run our code on the order of a few seconds um, because it's, it's running some pretty powerful analysis. Um, but that, that's something we're going to do in the future. And I think that there's a potential for many, many more just awesome static analysis tools that can be built on top of the Go Oracle. You should definitely check it out. Uh, Alan Donovan of Google gave an excellent talk about it uh, just before uh, Gotham Go at the end of last year that you should definitely check out. OK, so now I've gone over you know, how metaprogramming can help you write better tests, how it can, write, how, how it can, how it can help you check critical pieces of um, logic in your code base. Now let's talk about how it can help you with hassle-free distribution. So one of the key selling points of Go um, is the fact that Go lets you ship your app as just a single static binary. You don't have to worry about configuration. You don't have to worry about a bunch of other stuff that you have to ship alongside your, your application, right? Or does it? So if you're programming a web application, you have a bunch of other stuff that is not Go code, right? You have HTML template files. You have JavaScript and CSS. You have uh, logos and icons. Uh, you have fonts. And you have environment variables. Right? And all these are extra things that you can't just automatically ship um, as part of your, your Go binary. 
unless you use this awesome tool called Go Bin Data. Um, it was not written by us, it was written by this guy, Jim uh, Tewin. I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly. Um, but what is, it essentially does is it, you give it a directory that points to your static asset data, and it rolls that data into your Go binary. It generates code that embeds that data as uh, byte arrays. So instead of reading the data from the file system, it compiles it in the binary and then just reads it from uh, these byte arrays. And it has you know, an easy API to access that data. You just pass it the same uh, file paths as you would you know, pass the file system, and you can read your files. And another awesome feature of Go bin data is that you can pass a development flag uh, when you're developing. And what that does is when you're developing, it won't actually roll uh, stuff into the Go binary. It will just read from the file system. And the reason that's nice is because when you're developing, you might be changing those asset files rapidly. You might be changing the HTML JavaScript quickly, and you want those changes to be reflected immediately in your browser without having to run, rerun Go bin data. Um, but what's nice about this dev flag is that it presents the exact same API to the rest of your application. So the non-generated code does not have to change at all um, using Go bin data. Um, environment variables. So when, you, when your app gets more complicated, uh, like Sourcegraph, for example, I, I think has like around 40 environment variables um, that need to be set in order for it to, to run properly. Um, we wrote a little tool called Go Env Data. It's kind of the Go bin data of environment variables. It will just take all the environment variables set in the ambient environment, roll that in, and you can import the auto-generated code to set default values for your environment variables. And so the upshot of using uh, these two things is that our deployment process now is, is can be summed up in two lines of bash, one to fetch the uh, binary and the other one to, to run it, which is great. Okay, so now I've talked about sort of three areas where metaprogramming can help you uh, program better, write better code. Now, how do you actually incorporate this in your day-to-day -day dev process? So traditionally, um, you do this uh, with a make file. So this is a snippet from a make file that we use uh, for our app. And what you do is you specify targets. Um, the two main targets here are dev and dist. Um, and those will run all the, the meta programs that you want to run before actually compiling the code. But as of Go 1.4, there's this awesome thing called Go Generate, which Francesc talked about. Um, so I won't get too much into. But basically, it lets you uh, sort of run these meta programs in a way that's idiomatic Go, and that doesn't require pulling in an external uh, build tool. Okay, so I want to take a step back now and revisit an issue that I brought up at the very beginning of the talk, which is you know, this notion that metaprogramming is complex, and it does add complexity to your development process. There's more steps to worry about, there's increased mental overhead, and it can make things harder to debug. So the question is, when should I, you know, think about using metaprogramming to automate tasks uh, in my development process. And one principle that we've kept in mind at Sourcegraph when we're thinking about you know, to metaprogram or not to metaprogram is this principle of empathizing with the reader. So a lot of times we're motivated to uh, write metaprograms to automate uh, away certain tasks because we want to write code faster. Because you know, we think of ourselves as programmers as all about writing code. But I think what we often forget, uh, and Gabriel touched upon this a lot in his talk, is that uh, code, code is written once but read many times. So whatever benefit you incur in terms of being able to write your code faster, uh, there might be an associated penalty in terms of reading the code, the added complexity of, of reading through the code and understanding the extra magic that was added. And that extra penalty of reading the code, you should really multiply that by a factor of 10 uh, because you know, not only are you going to have to read the code down the road, but every, everybody on your team is potentially going to have to read that code as well and understand what it does. And so when you auto-generate code, it should ideally be human readable. The reader of the code shouldn't have to you know, worry about what metaprogramming technique you use to generate that code. And in general, you know, just avoid magic. Because magic is great when you're writing code. It's magic. It just works. But it's terrible when you're reading through code. Because you know, when you're reading through code trying to debug something, you actually have to figure out how the magic works. And that, that can be very tough. So here's a bunch of other examples of metaprogramming in Go. Um, you probably all actually use metaprogramming uh, without actually knowing it. You know, Go Fumped, Go Vet, these are all metaprograms, right? These are all programs that operate on other programs and, and change, change the source code. 
Um, there's, a, there's a great list of other tools you can use with GoGenerate. Um, and uh, something to point out about all these tools is a lot of these are very short and sweet. A lot of them are only two to 300 lines long, which is great because they're doing these you know, pretty complex things, you know, reasoning about the AST, um, auto-generating code, but they're short and concise. You can write them in an afternoon. You can write something in an afternoon that uh, automates away you know, a very painful or annoying part of your development process that you probably hit every day. And I think one of the reasons that a lot of these are quite short and sweet is that Go uh, makes all of this very accessible. So the Go standard library has excellent support for you know, getting at the AST, um, doing um, semantic analysis. There's just, there's just excellent support in the Go standard library um, for, for people who want to write metaprograms. And so you should, you should check it out. So the last thing I want to leave you with um, is you know, ideas for more metaprogramming. So if you take one thing away from this talk, it's this idea that metaprogramming is not this you know, pie in the sky, uh, complex thing that only experts should be doing. Um, you, yes you, should think about how you could write metaprograms that operate on your code to automate you know, certain annoying tasks that you do day to day as a programmer. So here's a couple ideas I just came up with on the plane ride uh, over, over here. Um, one is, you know, wouldn't it be awesome if you could generate an entire API client if I just gave you a set of you know, curl commands and JSON snippets? Like, think about all the web services that you want to use and all the time spent writing those API clients. And I think that's definitely doable um, with, with the libraries available at our disposal in Go. Um, it would be awesome to be able to generate you know, st a stub implementation that satisfies a set of interfaces and to be able to update that implementation automatically when you add methods to that interface. That's something that we do all the time. You add a method to the interface and now you have to copy and paste code to the implementations and that's annoying. And then the last thing I want to mention is uh, Sourcelib. So Sourcelib is a cross-language uh, analysis library that lets you write cross-language metaprograms. So, uh, and it, it powers one particular metaprogram uh, right now, which is sourcegraph.com, and also a variety of other editor plugins. And so the high-level goal of Sourcelib, it was heavily inspired by the types of uh, you know, packages we saw in the Go standard library available for um, static analysis. And the goal there is to make it as easy to write you know, useful metaprograms that work across a bunch of different languages um, as it is to write metaprograms in Go. So if this is something that gets you excited, you're excited about um, you know, improving the productivity of programmers across many different languages at once, uh, consider contributing to, to Sourcelib. And so, yeah, um, that's, that's basically my talk. Uh, I just want to leave you with uh, this mission. So now having seen these examples, I want you to go home and think about some awesome metaprograms that you can write and uh, automate away tedious tasks that we all do every day as programmers and then release them and share them with the rest of the Go community. Thanks.